express yourself to Jesus. Oh 
it's hard. It's hard enough to live this life as it is, but it's it's so much harder to live it without any joy. <coughs> without any joy. And we're not talking about happiness. Because a lot of times happiness depends on circumstance. As we are showing you here in Galatians 5 and 22, that that fruit of the Spirit is not just something that is dependent on circumstance. Right? It's something that you should have in your spirit as a part of your relationship with the Lord, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Amen? Because we're all faced with circumstances that could make us unhappy. Right? Unhappy. And sometimes you can be unhappy, but still have joy. And everybody knows what I'm talking about. If you're not saved, you don't know what I'm talking about. If you're out there listening to me and you're not saved, you have no idea what we're talking about. I'm not putting you down, I'm just telling you, you need, you need, to, you need Jesus first before you can have real joy. Right? Because we all out here, we've all had other things, and nothing compares to the Lord. Nothing. So let's look and let's start. I doubt if we're going to get the whole way through. All five of these things are going to help you cultivate your joy. Joy in the Bible comes in many different circumstances and many forms. So let's go back to the Old Testament verse in Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. This is where they rediscovered the Word of the Lord. And any time there's a rediscovery of the Word of the Lord, it's a reformation. That's what happened in 1517 through 1648 in the Thirty Years' War. When God raised up Martin Luther in Wittenberg, Zwingli in Zurich, and John Calvin in Geneva, what they did was they challenged the orthodoxy of the Catholic Church. And what they discovered was they were basically teaching people legalism. And even though they differed in some of their beliefs, they started cultivating, if you please, the foundational belief that the just shall live by faith. And that you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. This is what happened in the book of Nehemiah. The Bible said that they read in the book of the law of God. Distinctly. That means that they took their time to make sure that they first understood, as we'll see, as the governor, Nehemiah, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and all the Levites, when you look at the next verse, that they first understood, and they gave the sense. You can't teach somebody something that you don't know. Amen? Amen. And, and this, is, this is what is wrong. This is why we have entertainment in church today, and the lack of joy. Entertainment can make you happy. But it can't give you joy. And so a lot of people are going to church looking for happiness. I want to go to a church where I can get some joy. But I understand joy. So I can teach you about it. You see? I understand it so I can teach you about it. And they helped them understand what they were reading. They gave the understanding. They, they gave the sense and they helped them to understand what they were reading. And then the Bible talks about the governor and the, we, the people we just described. And they said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord our God. Mourn not, nor weep. This is why wow, this is a reformation. Everybody say reformation. 
There's a joy in reforming your life. That's what the Reformation was. It was reforming people's lives from legalism to faith. Every time you are under the Word of God, it's a reformation. You are being reformed every time you're under the Word of God. If you allow it to touch you the same way it touched these people. Because all that they all wept when they heard the words of the law. And when you read the story, he read it for a long time. But they all wept. Look at that attitude toward them. They were ready. Everybody say they were ready. You have to be ready for a reformation. Nobody can make you ready. The greatest preacher in the world cannot make you ready to be reformed. That's our problem. We're waiting on the preacher to always say something to us. The preacher can preach the most eloquent and analytical message. But if you're not ready to be reformed, it'll just be entertainment to you. And you'll walk out not changed. How many want to change tonight? How many will be honest with yourself and say, I may have lost some of my joy for Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost. But when a word comes, they say, wait, I know this is hurting you. The things that we read, and I know it's embarrassing, and you feel ashamed before the Lord right now because of your spiritual inadequacy. But they say, don't weep. And now, verse 10, he said, and go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them on whom, for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Neither be sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So that tells me, if your church is an entertainment-based church, your church is weak. You may have every seat filled but it's filled with weak people that are superficial. They only know Christ in a very superficial and nominal way. And for the pastor, it's selling Jesus like a, like a car salesman sells a car. The, 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 the car salesman sells the car not because he likes you. He was so nice. What, do you think he's going to be mean? <laughs> mean car salesman sells $200,000 in cars a year. No way. It's not going to be mean. Do you really think that he cares about you? No. He only cares about one thing. Check. Jesus, for a lot of preachers today, is just a check. That's all. He, 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 they're selling him so that they can be popular and get a big check. And Jesus is an easy sell. You're not having church with me. <laughs> I mean, how hard is it to sell somebody that can walk on water? How hard is it to sell somebody that can raise somebody from the dead? How hard is it to sell somebody that can raise themselves from the dead? Folks, that's an easy sale. You know, having a church with them. You understand? So there's a difference. And you have to be able to discern that. Because a lot of people get sucked in to the whirlwind 
of entertainment church. But there's no joy. And where there is no joy, there's no strength. Understand that you have to cultivate your joy on a daily basis. I'm going to prove that to you. On a daily basis. Make yourself be happy about Jesus. And I just gave you, and I didn't want to run through all the text, but I just gave you plenty of reasons. But just because of your own personal experiences with the Lord, when you start losing your joy, sit down for a minute, pull over, get into the pit stop. Somebody say amen. And just rehearse. How good the Lord's been to you. Has the Lord been good to anybody tonight? Because they were in Babylonian captivity, they forgot the law. But they also forgot the most important thing, that the Lord was good. So I, I don't know what they read, but I can't help believe that they must have read something that reminded them of how good the Lord was. Are you with me? That reforms us. That See, the problem with Reformation is you have to take the attention off yourself. <laughs> oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endured forever. Psalm 136, verse 12. You listening to me? A reformation can't take place when you're thinking about yourself. A reformation will take place and your joy will be reformed. Somebody say amen. amen. When you take the attention off of yourself and you come into God's house and all your attention is on how good God is. Amen. Everybody say, i got to cultivate my joy. Uh, I think I've, I've allowed my joy to wither a little bit. Listen, I'm going to tell you, here's one of the signs, and we'll move to the next point. Here's one of the signs that your joy has started withering. You start complaining. It's just a natural thing. You start complaining. It is no one's fault that you don't have joy. Don't say it's the worship team. Don't say it's the pastor. It's you. It's me. Somebody say amen. Number two, Isaiah chapter 12, 1 through 3. Everybody say redemption. You have to cultivate the joy of your redemption. Sometimes we just take for granted that Jesus died on the cross, paid the price for our sins, prepared a mansion, John 14, 1 through 3, for us in heaven. Come on. Took our sins. Isaiah 53 and verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him on a bloody cross to all our embarrassment and shame. And many times we take for granted our redemption. In that day thou shalt say, I will praise thee, O Lord, though thou was angry with me. Thy anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. He said, Behold, God is my salvation, my redemption. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song, and is become my salvation. The reason here that he says, is become my salvation, is he's referencing to the fact that they forgot it. I had it, and now He's become my salvation again. Therefore, with joy 
shall you draw water, everybody say singular, out of the wells, plural, of salvation. I try not to just say things just the same. I, I really seriously pray and think hard. When I have to do Bible study all day, no matter what I'm doing, I'm thinking about what I have to say. When, when I have to preach to you on Sunday or whatever, all week I'm thinking about what I have to say to you. So I didn't just bring up the different types of churches, happy churches, and churches that are filled with joy for no reason. The well here, or wells, plural, to me, the Bible is full of hyperbole, typology, and illustrations. To me, the wells are a type of the church, or churches. So, you should be able to go to church and be refreshed. Hmm? I, I would not go to church where I was getting beat up all the time. And some people just live with that, man. Everybody say, that's a bad relationship. Everybody say, that's verbal abuse. You're not having church with me. Sometimes people subject themselves to verbal abuse. There are two kinds of verbal abuse in church. The wells represent the church. Every church should have a supply of refreshing water. Right? That's what he's talking about in, in the 55th chapter, the first verse. Oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the water. Every church should have a supply of refreshing water because the world is a desert. Yeah, that's right. Come on, somebody. And, and it, it's sad to say, but many people are being born again in the desert. I preached a sermon years ago, Desert Babies. Many people are being born in some dry places. I mean, God can save anybody anywhere. But if you don't get to the water, you won't stay saved. <laughs> You're not having church with me. Some people are in a desert. And they're getting saved. But they won't stay saved very long. They'll go right back to their lifestyle. You have a church with me? You should be able to go to church and find that refreshing water, which is the Word of God. Right? The washing of water by the Word. God's Word is like a refreshing water. When you come out of that world, that world tries to dry you up, and the devil tries to suck all your joy out of you, just frustrates you, take your attention totally off of God, and what's really important to you. When I was teaching this over at Parkview a few weeks ago, I was leaving the building, and that day he walked up to me, and he said, he said, you said a lot of good things, Pastor Roy, and I liked it. He said, I was really paying attention. He said, but one thing you forgot to say. And I said, what was that, Ed? He said, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. <laughs> I said, boy, I wish I was that smart. That would have been perfect in that sermon. And it is true. I mean, you, you, how many times have you brought somebody to church? To the water. Come on, somebody. And, and try to offer them something refreshing, something that's really going to give them joy. They're miserable. But they still won't come to Jesus. They have adapted their life to a dry, miserable lifestyle. And there's nothing you can do 
The only thing that you can do is be an example of the fact that you have something better. Because that's exactly what Isaiah is saying to do. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Now, wait a minute. Why would anybody want what you have? And that's not an indictment, that's a question. Why don't you ask your neighbor that real quick? Ask him and tell him, make, make sure that they answer you. Why would anybody want what you have? I'm going to go off camera for a second. If, if, if you're bold enough to answer that question, raise your hand. Why would anybody want what you have? You're bold enough? I'm going off camera for a second. Because I don't need the world to make me happy. The world is stuff. I don't need it. All right? Because I don't need the world. Everybody say amen. Work, what makes me so happy? And I always see Jesus. So if I see someone happy, I'm going to want to know what they're on. They ask me, what are you on? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I say it's Jesus. But you see that, you want to know. Being happy. Anybody else? Why would somebody want what you have? Praise the Lord. Because people see things that I have that I don't even realize. When I first came to Christ, I knew that Christ was in me. And I asked the Lord, what do I have to do to show people the Christ? And he told me at that time, you must become transparent. When you are transparent, they will see the Christ in you. If they see you, that's all they're saying. Everybody say transparent. But Isaiah, the peace of the Lord that passes all understanding. Amen. Peace. But since we're trying to teach you to cultivate your joy, joy, not happiness, joy. A car can make you happy. A new suit can make you happy. New shoes can make you happy. Stealer tickets, if you're from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, can make you happy. Hello? But only one thing can give you joy. There's only one way to get joy. And that is to have Jesus Christ in your life. That's a fact. That's a fact. That's an absolute, 100, undisputable fact. That Jesus is the only thing that can give you joy. So if we're going to have be an example to people who live in that desert. We can't be as miserable as them. What did I say? When you lose your joy, you start complaining. Do you know the number one thing that causes church fights and church splits? Complaining. How dare you? How dare you complain about your church? God should take you out of it. How dare you complain about your pastor? How dare you complain about the worship team? Sometimes. <laughs> you guys don't know when to laugh. <laughs> well, you complain about the pastor all the time, so... Sometimes on the worship team, right? But all the time on the pastor. I'm, I'm thick-skinned, though. I can hear people complain but you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You could, don't you know that you one person complaining could cause a whole church to split? You want that on your conscience? I have to repeat this on Sunday. And, and not that I'm hearing anybody complain. I, I try not to do that anymore. I used to do that dumb stuff when I was a young preacher. You hear me? Listen, that means you lost your joy. That means that you don't appreciate your redemption. That means you are a bad example to those who are dry and thirsty for eternal life. 
They'll never want to come to church with you because the, the fact of the matter is you're not only complaining in church, you're complaining out of church. And guess what? You just become a big complainer. And, I, and last time I checked, there weren't many complainers in heaven. Because <laughs> you know why, don't you? You know why there's not complainers in heaven? Because they'll get to heaven and start complaining. They'll be like, man, Jesus, you know, you, you promised us these mansions, but, you know, these rooms ain't that big. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't have a church with me. You know, the young Lord, uh, I, I, I like singing, but you know, these angels are starting to get on my nerves a little bit. <laughs> all day and all night, hallelujah, praise the Lord all night. <laughs> you ain't have a church with me. <laughs> They'll get to heaven and just don't, <laughs> don't start complaining. That's why complainers aren't going to help. Tell your neighbor, don't you complain. Let that alone. Let's look at one more way to cultivate your joy. Everybody say, cultivate your joy. One more verse. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4. Cultivate your joy. This is the easiest, most fundamental way to cultivate your joy. It brings us back to what took place in the Reformation in Nehemiah chapter 8. And specifically what we looked at 8 through 10. These things have I written unto you that your joy, what? May be full. Wow. Wow. See, everybody say, I'm full of something. <laughs> All right? Everybody's full of something. And, and sometimes, the, the, sometimes the worst thing is to be full of a little bit of everything. Hmm? Some people are just full of a little bit of everything. I mean, you could, they could leave church. They could leave Wednesday night Bible study and ride right over to the bar and feel comfortable. And probably not in this church because we have joy here and not just happiness. Somebody say amen. But in those desert churches, you can leave those desert churches, walk right out and go down with your buddies and get a couple beers. Well, that preacher's condemning. No, that preacher's just full of joy. I don't need beer. I used to drink beer. And I used to drink beer that probably most of you ever could imagine. I'm not picking on people. I'm just telling my testimony. I'm just saying, folks, you're full of something. What you are is what you are all the time. Not just when you walk in here. Some people just put a little cap on who they really are. And then they imitate what everybody else has. I feel sorry for you. Just go on and take the cap off. Let the real you come on out. Just climb out the cake. <laughs> Seriously, let the real you come out. We'll help you. Tell your neighbor, we'll help you. Tell them, we'll help you, man. You don't have to fake. What you are full of is what you're full of. Now, if you want to be full of joy, John gives us a prescription to fill your diagnosis. I've been losing my joy. That's the diagnosis. You come in to church, I see you're not raising your hands, I'm diagnosing you. You come into church, you used to sit in the front, now you're sitting in the back, I'm diagnosing you. You come into church, you used to used to hear you saying amen. Now I don't hear nothing. I'm diagnosing you. Now you're not even coming to church. I'm diagnosing you. Diagnosis? You have withered. Your excuse me, your joy has withered. Prescription? I'm gonna 
I want to write you up a script. Oh, I don't have to write you up a script. It's already been written. Sixty-six books. There's your script. You with me? We got one minute. Listen. John said, these things have I written unto you. If John wrote it, what did he want him to do? Huh? He wanted him to read it. Did he want him just to get it and see, oh, this is from John. One sure way to get your joy back is start reading what has been written. That means that you don't wait for Sunday and Wednesday to come. That means that you make a time every day to pick up your script. Come on, somebody. And when you pick up your script, the Holy Ghost comes in and meets you there and starts touching you. And it's hard. It's hard to remain discouraged and dry when you're putting yourself in the Word. God knows that. That's why God said, look, I'm not just going to give him one book because I know human nature. Human nature will be, oh, I already read that. That's what human nature. If God gave us one book, even though it is one book, but it's an anthology of 66 books, He really gave us 66 books because He knows how we are. But He gave us one book, oh, I already read that. I already read that. So I'll give a 66 book and there's not a human being that ever walked the face of this earth that will ever, ever say, I completely understand the whole Bible. Amen. So there's no way to get bored with this book. If you're bored, that means you're just bored. <laughs> Everybody say, don't blame being bored on the Bible. This book is exciting. Uh, I can't even sometimes get past the first 28 verses, 29, 30 verses, 31 verses, 30, 31 verses. I can't get past the first chapter. How can you read Genesis chapter 1 and not get excited? thinking about what God did in six days. That should lift you up immediately because if God could create all these things in the universe in six days, what can He do for you? That's what I always get out of the first chapter. If God can do all this, then God can do anything for me that I need done. Tell your neighbor it's going to be alright. Raise your hand. Come on somebody. Tell your neighbor it's going to be alright. Stand to your feet. Come on. Stand to your feet. Lord, we're cultivating our joy. And we still have a couple more points to talk about. But tonight, reform us in your word. And Lord, as your word convicts us, let us have the right attitude. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, let us be an example to those who live in the desert. That what we are getting from you is refreshing. And that's why we come back to church with joy because we know we're going to be refreshed. And we're asking you right now in the name of Jesus to never get bored with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.